Hello, listeners, and welcome to another episode of Cognitive Dissidents. As usual, I'm your host. I'm Jacob Shapiro. I'm a partner and the director of geopolitical analysis at Cognitive Investments. Joining me on the podcast today is Kevin Evans. He's the Indonesia director at the Australia Indonesia Center. Like so many of our guests, uh, Kevin is somebody that I reached out to, a cold email into the ether, and Kevin responded. Not only did he respond, he was an absolutely terrific guest, and I really want to thank him for his time. Uh, He is based in Jakarta, so that means, listeners, that I stayed up late here. Um, uh, It was early morning for Kevin and and late evening here for me. I'm actually on the road uh, recording this podcast. So if you check this out on YouTube, that's why it looks like I'm in a Hampton Inn because I am in a Hampton Inn right now. Um, But this was actually a really great way to to talk about. We're going to do some more um, episodes about Indonesia, Indonesia's elections. I think this is one of the most important countries in the world that nobody is talking about. Um, And also from an investment perspective, really, really interesting one that we're doing a lot of due diligence and research about. Um, for our clients and our strategies at CI. Okay, enough preamble for me. Kevin is the interesting part. If you want to talk about what we do at CI, if you want to talk to me about anything, this podcast, books, uh, food recommendations in whatever city you're in, I am at your disposal. Take care of the people you love. Cheers and see you out there. Kevin, thank you so much for answering a cold email from somebody who could have been, you know, uh, strange and nothing to you, but you've been very gracious and, and happy to have you on the podcast. Thank you for joining us. Delighted to speak with you, Jake. It's great to meet. Um, so I feel like most of the time, especially an American audience, but in general in the West, uh, I would doubt that most people could even point to Indonesia on a map, uh, let alone name the capital or do anything else. But I will say they Indonesia has been sort of lopped into the democracies having elections this year. We get the India, Indonesia, United States, and Mexico. So there's a little more interest, I think, than normal out there for Indonesia. Um, but before we get down to the election, what's been happening recently, how to think about it, Um, just give the, you were already giving me some of your background, so I'm going to make you repeat it for the listeners. So just tell me how it is that, um, somebody from Australia ended up in, in, in in Indonesia for as long as you have. Well, it, it started actually, you know, these many life changing events happen at a, a a kind of a a flick of a moment, right? So Mm -hmm. when I was joining my high school in Brisbane, uh, Australia, the headmaster said, here at this school, son, we teach three languages, French, German, or Indonesian. Which do you want? Uh, and my answer was, well, all of my mates around the playground are all doing French and German, and those countries are so far away, I'll never meet them. Indonesia is certainly closer, so I'm bound to run into them during my lives. That sounds a bit more interesting. So I'll take Indonesian. And uh, that completely turned my life. Uh, so I enjoyed the studies. Uh, and got really interested in the, you know, the culture and the broader aspects. Uh, made a first visit during the end of high school year. My teacher took us for a trip. And I decided during uh, high school, I'm going to do Indonesian studies at university. And fortunately, we had a great university nearby that taught modern Asian studies. So I just delved further. And the more I got into it, the more sort of uh, addicted I became. Uh, a couple of exchanges later, and I realised I really enjoyed being in the country. Uh, so I meandered and ended up with the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade and just waited in Canberra until they would uh, finally renege and post me to Jakarta, where I basically have been since the early 90s. And uh, so after several years there, I, I eventually uh, pensioned myself out of the public service and joined uh, a merchant bank from Australia in the stock market and waited lived through the Asian financial crisis. I think every decent stockbroker has to go through a boom and a bust. And so (laughs) I I went through that one. And uh, I also, I also just wanted to stay here until, until the old man, you know, President Suharto, until he finally went, because I seriously believe the country would have been a better place after. And I've been so delighted that that's exactly what's happened. So I got very much involved in the political reform issues, working with President Habibi's legal reform. He had a bunch of political scientists that were leading the reform of the political system for democratization, uh, worked with the Electoral Commission, and anyway, various other things. The only time I was out was was when the United Nations bribed me to go to Afghanistan for a year when they kicked the Taliban out for the first time uh, to help set up some governance programs there based upon a lot of experiences from Indonesia. So back uh, here, uh, yeah. I, I know you're obviously speaking tongue in cheek, but I can't help but but ask. So, what what does a UN bribe look like to get you out of the the chosen home that in Indonesia <laughs> that you have to go to Afghanistan of all places? 
<laughs> That's true. I mean, I mean, the stock market people were always trying to bribe me to go to Hong Kong, London, and New York when they failed. So somehow the UN got me to Afghanistan. Um, I think at the end of the day, it was thinking, you know, so much has changed in Indonesia over these past few years. It might be very useful actually to get a refresher, uh, a, a different mm. perspective on on developments in a Muslim majority country to see it from the perspective of another country. Um, and obviously, you know, Afghanistan was a, a key issue at the time, a key, you know, global challenge and and focus at the time. And so I thought, okay, finally, yeah, I'll go for a year um, and then I'll come back because uh, we've, I've got to help prepare for the 2004 elections in Indonesia. But uh, so happily went along and it was a very valuable experience. I, it, was, uh, it was incredibly useful. Um, well, I guess my first question before we get into the elections and sort of the things that are more immediate, I mean, you have seen so much change happen in Indonesia. I mean, you, you've alluded to Suharto. I mean, j just the past five years has been like a, an incredible change in Indonesia, let alone what you've seen. So w what are the things that have changed the most when you reflect back on all of these decades that are there? I mean, what, what would people not even believe was was your first experience of the country and how has it changed? Sure. This is actually my eighth election that I've gone through in Indonesia. So I've, I've, I've seen, I've seen uh, you know, very pre-democratic elections, uh, very democratic elections. And, and this past one, which um, gave me some pause for concern. So I think um, something happened and I, I'm still struggling to work out what it was. So after the last elections in 2009, uh, 19, uh, something suddenly changed. Um, uh, the government stopped and the parliament stopped being concerned about public concerns in many respects, uh, started legislating on high, you might say, uh, without the, the standard kind of public and uh, public consultative processes that we'd come to expect since the early reform period. And I'm not exactly sure, I'm still struggling to understand what exactly it was um, so, you know, to go back to a couple of the earlier elections, I mean, I always have a couple of funny little vignettes. Uh, one was the proud, the proud declaration from a governor of one province uh, that President Suharto's party had won 95% of the vote in the elections, which was an impressive effort, uh, but it was announced a day before polling. Um, <laughs> So, um, and that, so we've come a long way since uh, <laughs> since those days. But uh, during this particular election cycle, the president has come out using an interesting Javanese term, not an Indonesian language term, but a Javanese term to say uh, he thought it was his business to uh, sort of, I, I think, I guess the best way to translate would be to manipulate intrigue uh, into mm. the elections. And so I think there has been some unhealthy, um, and it felt a bit sad, frankly, like the last election under President Suharto was a very sad election, frankly. The year before, they'd violently moved in to remove Megawati from, from the par her party's control uh, and that uh, shut down any pretense of sort of media uh, media contestation, although they during the actual election period. It was a very interesting period because they actually did provide some fair coverage for the two minor parties. Um, mm. But obviously, once you've orchestrated so beautifully before the election, whatever happens on the campaign itself is pretty meaningless. Um, the thing that left me feeling a bit sad was there was completely no need to behave like that. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it was quite clear the president's preferred candidate was always going to win this election. Once we knew that there were three candidates and where they were situated, uh, he, he was a shoe in so whether it, the only issue was whether it was one or two rounds and the constitution demands that anybody who wins here doesn't just have to be the most popular person say like in the us uh, you've actually got to be the most acceptable and that means you've got to show that 50 percent of the public will put up with you uh, so it's a, it's a it's a very good dynamic uh, and i think it also prevents radical polarization so with three candidates in the race uh, the man in the middle was uh, was but for a ball so as soon as that was out, he was unbeatable because the voters for the right candidate would never jump across to vote for the left. 
and the left would never vote across. It's like in the US. You, you wouldn't get MAGA people voting for Bernie Sanders and you wouldn't get the Bernie Sanders people voting for a MAGA candidate. You'd vote for somebody who was, uh, who was moderate in the middle. Now, the question that has to arise uh, is, is there a reasonable gravitas of, of people who are, in the, who are in the middle? And I think the political culture that works around them at a 50% plus system uh, probably encourages that rather than uh, agitating your, 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 your angry red meat base from whatever base that happens to be at the expense of everybody else. So that was, uh, that was why uh, General Prabol, you know, Pat Prabol was unbeatable from that period. So there was frankly no need to engage in all this, all this, uh, all, all this kind of intrigue and, 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 uh, and behaviour, which kind of, I think, sort of uh, uh, denigrates to an extent the good work that had been undertaken by the 10 years of this president. Yeah. Um, on the point about, about MAGA people voting for Bernie, I actually I remember very vividly being at a wedding in rural Georgia where, where I grew up um, and, uh, you know, asking some of, some of the folks there, you know, who are you voting for? And they all said Trump. And I was like, just, it was just beginning to come into my consciousness that Trump was, was actually had a, had a puncher's chance. And of course he ended up winning, but I, I was curious and I asked them, well, so who do you like more on the democratic side? If you had to vote for Hillary or Bernie, who would you go for? And to a, to a man and to a woman, it was, well, at least Bernie tells the truth. Uh, Hillary is the worst. We hate Hillary more than anything else. So there, there's something about the spectrum. Perhaps like, I should have said AOC. I perhaps should uh, have said AOC <laughs> rather yeah, than Bernie. Okay. Because, yes, Bernie also uh, <laughs> a, 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 attracts what I, you, you might call it the shit kickers, you know, the ones that will say, let's just do it and see what happens. Um, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, yeah, I think that you're, you're correct. And that actually doesn't surprise. I'm sorry, I should have said AOC uh, rather than Bernie. Well, so having been around for Suharto, though, like, so yeah. does the manipulation of the intrigue, does it feel like a return? Does it feel like something completely new? Like, like I know you said you're struggling to sort of put it into words yourself, but is there a nostalgia to it? Or do you think that some new force is at work behind all of this? Well, firstly, we're nowhere near what was going on there. Uh, so whatever's happened now is still is whatever used to happen in the in the old system is degrees way way uh, more extreme than anything that's been attempted thus far, um, and, and also the pushback. Um, well, it was minimal and certainly no effective pushback uh, under the old system. Uh, there are still capacities now. Uh, to make yourself heard. And the parliament, um, while much of it's been uh, brought into the governing coalition, actually the lead party supporting the, uh, of the president himself are actually leading uh, efforts to establish a parliamentary inquiry to look at the various, uh, the impacts of these various intrigues and so forth that have, uh, that have gone on. Uh, so there is still, the, the system is a lot more robust uh, than it used to be, but that's not to say, and, and I, I also take caution from things I've seen in the US, that, you know, the guardrails can can uh, fall apart uh, if, you, if you've got a leader that simply doesn't care uh, about such things or believes they're above it or whatever it else is or think they're the only one that can save the country. And so you can, you can get into some sort of a bubble that uh, allows you to uh, justify uh, undermining well-established norms and standards and so forth. And I think that's a little bit where we are. Um, the big question is uh, our, our incoming uh, president and uh, what kind of legacy he would like to leave for the country. And what do you think that le legacy is? I mean, he, P Prabowo is sort of, I mean, he's a chameleon. He has changed so many different times. I'm not sure who he actually is. Do, do you have any sense? Yeah, I, well, first of all, now he's, he's in his 70s. So I think um, the earlier kind of, you know, the younger Prabowo with the fire in the belly has perhaps matured a bit. And I've also, you know, you've got um, feedback, I guess, or comments back from people who didn't used to like him. Mm -hmm. um, to say that they've noted that he's kind of changed in the last few years. He's much more relaxed in himself. 
and, and, and I also think he has a very strong sense of the nation's narrative, you know, even more than the incumbent president, much more than the incumbent president, and, and of where Indonesia can sit within the world, mm -hmm. uh, and also of his family's place within the national narrative. And that would weigh upon him quite a bit. And I think in a positive way, not a negative way. Would he want to conclude his presidency facing the opprobrium that his former father-in-law, his late father-in-law, President Suharto, faced for so many years? Or would he like to be seen as someone who contributed well to the strengthening of the Indonesian state? And so I know that there's a kind of a proclivity around, I think, strong leader equals strong state. And, of course, it's quite the reverse. Um, and so I'm very interested to see how he would see, uh, and I believe he has a, has a sense, uh, in a, and I believe that to be in a positive way, of uh, what sort of a legacy he would like to leave. And, and so I actually go in with a slightly different view to a lot of others. A lot of others have kind of never moved, moved forward from the, the horror stories that we're all more than familiar with. And frankly, uh, I think also uh, one other point that I'd definitely say in his, in his favour is pretty much most of the generals or other senior people in Indonesia when anybody comes to raise questions about their human rights record, uh, <laughs> they usually start screaming hysterically, PKI, PKI, you know, Indonesian Communist Party, Indonesian Communist Party, as if that's some sort of a legal defence or a moral defence or, or in any kind of defence uh, mm -hmm. against any kind of, uh, of questioning. Um, unlike all of those, uh, President-elect Prabowo has actually reached out to people who have been impacted uh, through his chains of command. And many of those people have actually joined with him in his party and so forth. Uh, and that's not just within Indonesia. I, I have to say I, I bore witness to I think was one of the most surrealist moments in my life. So around about 20-odd years ago, 2001 or so, we were just beginning to implement the regional autonomy or the decentralisation of Indonesia program as part of the wider democratisation issue. And because I'd been involved in, in much of that work with the president, the former president's team, um, you know, I was often involved with these, you know, talk shops where we'd be trying to explain what was going to, to happen. And so I rock up to this one and suddenly uh, uh, Mr. Prabhu is, is, uh, is a fellow speaker, which struck me as very interesting. So nice to meet you, Pat. And then just as this session was about to begin, uh, the announcer says, ladies and gentlemen, we have a very special guest today. I'd like you to welcome Mr. Janana Gusmao. And I thought, did I hear something different? <laughs> and so suddenly, you know, entering stage less, left is Janana. Prabhu jumps up, uh, walks across, great big bear hugs, uh, and, and then the, the, the program soon begins. So I spoke to the, to the people afterwards and I said, what on earth happened then? And they explained, well, after the session, uh, Prabhu took Janana with him went to his car, told his driver to go home for the night. He personally drove Janana for six hours around Jakarta, just talking, just the two of them. Wow. And so, you know, it's not in the slightest bit surprising that in the soon after, and his victory hasn't yet been formally declared, right? So it's just right. provisional, looks pretty obvious, it's not going to be overturned. Uh, so it's uh, so the final result will, will be as it's, as it's projected. Now, he has already been invited uh, by the, the president of East Timor to visit before or after inauguration. So, and and that would clearly be because of the Prime Minister who's currently uh, Janana Guzman. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think in that regard, he's demonstrated the capacity to reach out in a way that is quite unusual uh, in this country. And uh, I, just, I just find there are some very interesting aspects uh, that I think people tend have tended not to focus on. They've, they've focused on some of the other stuff, uh, which is not always very nice, um, but they've not focused on, on his capacity in those areas, which I, I find to be uh, extremely refreshing and, and offer prospects for, uh, for the country to begin to deal with some of the 
uh, some of the abuses that have taken place. And in many respects, uh, my feeling is just sort of grabbing somebody and saying it's all your fault rather misses the point because the nature of those abuses under the previous regime was standard operating procedure. Now, if you were a military person operating in the logistics or the peacekeeping end, well, you're not going to be involved in that tough kind of uh, uh, conflict side. But if you're at the strike end of the armed forces, well, I'm sorry, that's part and parcel of, of what ended up having to happen. Uh, so I, I, I think that there is also a need for the nation itself to begin to confess up to the fact that what happened historically was part of the standard operating procedures. And the same thing would have been meted out to anybody anywhere across the archipelago, not, not just in the, in the fringe areas beyond the, beyond the tourist mm. cameras. Um, and so to me, part of the process is actually say, we've got to learn about what happened. We don't want that ever to happen again. So, you know, let's let's stop personalising this and grabbing a couple of individuals and blaming them for everything. Let's actually understand how this came to be so we don't repeat this appalling behaviour again. Our, our country can grow as a much better country uh, by not uh, in, including this as part of our repertoire of dealing with citizens who have come to a different op opinion to the uh, to national policy. So. Yeah, I mean, it's not just strange for an Indonesian context. It's strange. Strange is maybe the wrong word. I mean, you don't see many politicians with that capacity to change and to have it be sort of that genuine. Do you think that that is why Jokowi picked him? Or or how, how do you explain why Jokowi went with Prabowo? Because, I mean, I'm, I'm, a no, I'm, more, I'm more than a novice compared to you. I know nothing compared to you about Indonesia. But like when, when it first seemed like he was going to be the heir apparent, I was very confused. And I'm sure other people who you know, sort of have a dilettante approach to Indonesia. Uh, it, that's a very easy one to explain. Um, imagine for a moment in a parallel universe that he had given his full support to candidate Ganja from his own party, from the PDIP party, led by... Uh, you know, party chair for life, Megawati, former president. Mm -hmm. He would know the day after Ganja won that he and his family would be expunged from the political process by Megawati. Hmm. So any future that he or his family might have thought they could have would be under serious, uh, serious, probably fatal threat uh, from her. She neither forgets, forgives, nor moves on. And she believes that he has been insufficiently... Um, uh, obeisant to her and same thing for the family and so she would see him as simply disloyal and therefore has to be removed as has so many other people over the decades that she's been in charge of a party. She runs a very tight ship. On the other end of the spectrum, uh, worried to have thrown his support behind uh, Anis Baswaden, uh, highly unlikely, but worried to have done that it would be likely that he would have faced a not dissimilar kind of outcome and his whole positioning on the political spectrum would have been undermined because Anis ran a campaign basically appealing to right-wing kind of sentiment. Uh, uh, so that wasn't where it is. So at, at the end of the day, he had no choice but to support candidate Prabowo. And interestingly enough, they've really seemed, from everything that we've seen, to have developed a great rapport. So yeah. it, it's more than just, I think, uh, a bit of quick opportunism. I think there is definitely a mutual recognition and there's certainly a mutual respect from uh, Pat Prabowo himself uh, to Pat Jokowi. I mean, they do. there is a, a, a feeling of, a, of affinity and, and collegiateness and, and, and uh, President Jokowi has a similar feelings for Prabowo. So actually it's an alliance that's made by something a little bit more than just tactical opportunism in order to get over the line for the next election. Uh, secondly, he really had no option politically anyway other than to go with Prabhu. Um, mm. And so I think what we will see with time, obviously, is as, uh, as, as Prabhu moves into the presidency, I mean, his authority will enhance, uh, but uh, the uh, Jokowi and his family and, and, and so forth will be free to pursue uh, their political careers as they want uh, within the country without inhibition. Hmm. What, um, what differences do you think We'll, we'll see in Prabowo's policy versus Jokowi. And, and will those be immediately apparent? Will they take a long time to sort of emerge? Do you think the affinity 
um, you know, uh, sort of resonates on those policy lines? Or, or do you think that Prabowo will really try and put his own stamp on, on his approach to Indonesian government policy? This man has wanted to be president since he was, since before Jokowi was born. I mean, he is, <laughs> so um, he does have a couple of, uh, so what I tend to look at is not what he may have said in this particular election, but what's he's been saying over a longer period of time? Because that to me suggests genuine commitment mm -hmm. rather than, you know, what have I got to say to get over the line to this election, right? Um, and, and with regards to the current government, it's very interesting that what they're actually doing normally, and this would be the same thing in the US, so a new president coming in basically has to start from scratch by having their agenda beginning to be put into the budgetary processes and all of that sort of stuff. So as often as not, you waste a year before you can begin to implement what you'd want to do. Um, this government, the outgoing Jokowi government, has actually begun to include within its proposed budget for next year initiatives that President-elect Prabowo has been promoting. So this uh, program uh, that, that he's announced for, uh, you know, lunch and milk for children across the country, uh, is one of those where they're working now to include that within the budget uh, papers for next year. So by the end of this year, that will be endorsed. And so the incoming government will be free to begin implementing one of its key initiatives uh, from the start of next year. So that's a very, I don't recall that happening in any of the other transitions uh, before. Mm -hmm. So that to me is a, a very interesting uh, development and clearly suggests a that collegiate process will continue. Now, he does have a couple of other initiatives which will be new. So he's stated an intent to continue with the, the new capital city in Kalimantan, in Borneo. That's fine. Uh, but he's also had a program for a long time of trying to develop a special development authority that will cover Jakarta and the broader uh, megapolitan around Jakarta, which is about 30 million people. So at this stage, that cuts across three separate provinces. So Jakarta is a province. Bunton's a province and West Java's a province, but there are highly urbanised regions on the fringes of Jakarta. So he's had this idea for a long time that we need to integrate development across these regions, whether it's transport, social services and other kinds of social and physical infrastructure. That's, that's been a commitment for a while, and he's often suggested that that be seated under the office of the vice president, so really elevated even above a ministerial position. Um, so I believe that continues to be one of his uh, commitments. And that's something that's not been raised by any other candidate that I'm familiar with um, mm. in, uh, in any of the candidates. So he's also uh, indicated a, a endorsement of the continuing the downstreaming process for, you know, for, for minerals production. We need to understand that that's an article of faith in Indonesian industrial policy making. This, this wasn't invented by Jocko. It wasn't invented by President Udiono. This goes way back decades before. And it's a, it's a fundamental belief that for a country to become a developed country, developed countries don't export raw materials. Mm -hmm. They actually export manufactured products. Now, I think when they say that, they've never looked south. They have only ever looked north uh, yeah. because Australia doesn't do any kind of manufacturing. I mean, it's all just dig it up and flog it off. Uh, but for everybody else around, uh, around the Asia Pacific, Asia Pacific region in particular, uh, their view is that if you want to be a developed country, you've got to have a serious manufacturing capacity. So going way back to really the end of the 70s right through to now successive governments have looked at ways of forcing the pace on processing raw materials into manufactured products for export. And so it's, it's largely been seen as a success. Uh, and for nickel, it's been, a, a, again, a, a quite a super yeah. success in many ways, but uh, there are some side effects. Uh, some of them are a little more problematic. Uh, copper, I would say, because the value added that you get from, from you know, spending a billion dollars to have a copper processing mine is simply not worth the effort because the value added is, is only about 5% or something very low like that. That's what I've been, to, uh, I've been told. Bauxite might be an option, um, hmm. but then I, even on the copper thing, you might go upstream rather than downstream. So companies that use copper, they might want to invest in that because they're, they're not going to be paying a lot more for the copper that, uh, that's being produced. So a different model could be applied there in order to encourage that. Uh, so that I would not expect a great deviation uh, from that kind of, of, uh, of a process. 
Well, l- let me ask you to put on your, your stockbroker, merchant banker hat for a second. Um, are you bullish? Are you, are you bearish? Or are you just sort of sort of sitting in between? I mean, there, I've, if you look at sort of Indonesian opportunities, I mean, they've sort of been uh, muted. It hasn't really been that volatile, but it, it feels like Indonesia is in the right place at the right time. It has all the right minerals. It's doing all the right things. I, I often joke that, you know, five, seven years ago, uh, Indonesia was the redheaded stepchild of the IMF and the World Bank. It was always, oh, they're not doing things well. They're not efficient. And now it's like completely flipped on its head. It's like actually Indonesia is doing the right thing and Malaysia and the neighbors are not doing the right thing. Um, But how how do you feel about just economic and investment performance of Indonesia in the future? Because it's it's been a laggard over the last 15, 20 years, even with the the growth rates that we've seen. You know, one of the things about uh, Indonesia um, and this is actually a quote from somebody quite, uh, quite prominent here, was to indicate that Indonesia is the largest invisible thing in the world. <laughs> um, it, it's, simply, it, it's simply not on anybody's radar. And I think you made the point at the outset uh, that people are simply not familiar with it. So the first thing is, is people need to be aware of, of what this country is, has. Um, and that, that's, that, I think, is the start. That, I think, will be a much changed position under the incoming president. The incoming president is much more comfortable dealing with international audiences and mm-hmm. to do so at a much more elevated and, and uh, pluralist way in terms of to speak on a range of issues, not merely bring me some money and I'll flog off some stuff. So yeah. that's kind of been the front and centre part of foreign policy over the last 10 years, uh, with some distractions because of the wars, you know, the war in, uh, in Ukraine, uh, which has disrupted trade. And, and so therefore that suddenly said, gee, we've got to do something about that. And, and in terms of global inflation and resource costs and so forth. So that, was, that, was, that kind of forced a focus beyond uh, standard uh, standard uh, trade and investment concerns. Uh, President Prabowo will have a much broader view and understanding of what of, of those sort of uh, strategic issues and a much greater comfort zone in engaging, particularly with the West. So mm-hmm. as you know, Indonesia has, um, since the early 1950s, always avoided any kind of, of pact or military arrangement, military alliance with any country. Um, and they will continue to do so. Uh, so they will be, they will continue to be a leader of of the non-aligned movement. But within that non-aligned perspective that they that they manage, they can drift a little to this side or drift a little to that side. Uh, and so during the late Sukarno period, they drifted quite a bit towards, you know, the what they used to call a sort of a, 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 a towards Beijing. Um, the, the old Communist Party was had quite close relations with the Communist Party of China. So the country itself drifted a little bit down that direction. During the Suharto period, they drifted towards more towards the West. But I think in the last 10 years, a lot of people would say they've, they've, uh, they've situated quite closely with China, uh, particularly mm-hmm. because uh, of, of investments in strategic areas, strategic minerals, nickel and so forth. Um, and haven't been especially, I would say, haven't been especially aggressive in pushing back against unilateral literary nine dash lines and various other interventions into Indonesian territorial waters. Uh, my, my view would be that President Prabowo, certainly as a military man, uh, would take a, a, a more up, a, a tougher approach on those kind of uh, issues and negotiation. And I think would like to have a more balanced relationship uh, with uh, Western countries, um, but at the same time would be looking forward to increasing trade and investment with them as well uh, to counterbalance. But it would be it would be within the framework of continuing to ensure Indonesia remained a non-aligned country, uh, but would be very happy to partner and work with uh, with all sides. Uh, but I think he'd be. Uh, more inclined to uh, willing to be invest diplomatically in strengthening his relationship uh, with the Western nations. Um, so it's, I guess, in some respects, up to the Western nations. So they want to embrace him or not. Hmm. 
Um, d- does that mean though? So, I mean, is that good for the Indonesian economy? Is that bad for the Indonesian economy? Are Indonesian companies you think going to be able to take advantage of this? I mean, it's a very, very young market from that point of view. So, but it's, it's also, I mean, I, I put it in there with Brazil and with India and you know, some of these rising powers and rising markets, but Indonesia in some ways has, has more advantages than a lot of these rising powers. So are, are you similarly optimistic or, or do you think that some of the things that Indonesia has to face about its past or, or rise above are, are going to hold them back as it has in, in recent years? Yeah, I think, um, look, they've always got options uh, to move forward uh, and they're well placed in a, in, a, in a region with reasonably good growth prospects to be able to take advantage of that. So that's always a strength. Um, what kind of policies uh, would help? Um, they've slipped recently, as I said, something changed in 2019. So just a bit of an outline. On the mm-hmm. Transparency International's uh, Corruption Perception Index, which most people track. Uh, yes, we all know the the quest. You know, there are issues on the the methodology and and you know perceptions versus reality and perceptions versus sensitivity. So, you know, one that always made me laugh was when Megawati became president. Indonesians were screaming that this was grand nepotism mm-hmm. because a father had once been president, even though he died thirty years before any of this ever happened. In Singapore, when uh, uh, the current prime minister became prime minister and his father was still sitting in cabinet, did the Singaporeans scream grand nepotism? No, they said this is the cream rising to the surface. So if there's no sensitivity, we get that. I get that. But in terms of the corruption perception index itself, Indonesia had been at the bottom of the world at the time of the transition. So it was was not a, a good place in that regard. And in, in countries in transition, it takes a little time to get your strategies right and your institutional arrangements right. So after 2004, we had an, uh, a corruption eradication commission with considerable powers uh, put in place. And what we saw was a continuous increase, slow but steady, until 2019 when the country actually entered the top half of the world. It was an extraordinary mm-hmm. national achievement to have come from the bottom of the world slow but steady, actually entering the top half of the world. And then after 2019, it's gone back to where it was 10 years ago. So really problematic. And the components of the calculation for Indonesia were on political risk, not in terms of electoral, because in, it, it still rose uh, in the three previous election cycles. So it wasn't electoral contestation that was the political risk. It was clearly other things that was seen as a political risk. And that would obviously have included sort of an erosion of guardrails of due process and stuff like that. So that's where I think there's some important um, uh, homework for the country to focus on and for the leadership uh, to really focus on as well is to demonstrate a recommitment to those kind of standards because that will eventually have an impact on the cost of capital, uh, on the cost of doing business, uh, on general perceptions of whether you want to do business and so forth, and more importantly, what kind of investors would be willing to wander into that field and are they really the kind of investors that you believe are going to present the best opportunities for really developing the country? Uh, and so I, I, my view is that they do need to start taking this a lot more seriously uh, than, uh, than they have been. It was, a, it was incredibly sad uh, to see this slippage. Hmm. Um, and, and you really like, can you, can you venture a guess? I mean, do you have a working theory about what, what turned around in 2019 or is it really just kind of a mystery right now? I'm really struggling, but it may have been overconfidence by the incumbency to say we can do it, we can do this, uh, and, Mm. and sort of to get away with it. You've got a, a massive overweight sort of coalition committed to supporting the government. And unlike Strangely, uh, in the last few years, unlike the US, where even when you've got the same party in charge of the White House, the Senate and the House of Representatives, the poor old president can't get anything through that, through that Congress. So it's actually not an issue of, uh, of partisan divide. Uh, it, it's actually, you know, it's not like you have a loyal opposition like you, you do in a parliamentary system. You actually have a constitutional opposition between the, uh, the legislative branch and the executive branch, and that becomes the problem. But here they've managed to subdue the legislative branch to the point that it's really not 
raised much of a, a raised effective opposition. There are a couple of parties that are not part party to the government, but uh, they they are very small percentage of the parliament, and so uh, not not so uh, not so able to really hold the government to account on. On, on difficult issues, but I would say it's 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 more the norms. It's not like you're breaking a law. It's no, you're, you're kind of abrogating norms that have been built up over twenty years. So in many respects, that to me is what's really important. You don't have to legislate every single you know bit of behaviour that well, that's a, an appalling kind of a system. Uh, there should be norms that people accept as part of the way you behave. And so when you stray beyond that, there, there should be consequences. And quite clearly, that's not been the case. Yeah. How do you feel about um, Australia Indonesia relations? Do you feel that they're they're progressing? Yeah, well, that they're again, uh, yeah. So actually, again, in the wake of the election, um, our deputy prime minister has already come up and and uh, you know broken bread with the president elect. Uh, they'd actually been working together over the last couple of years because the deputy prime minister is also our defence minister, so has been his his uh, natural counterpart during this time. And I would expect, as usual, the Prime Minister will attend in the inauguration of the President uh, in, on August, uh, October 20. Um, they've, they've, uh, everything that I've gathered, they've enjoyed uh, their partnership with him um, in, the, in the various uh, policy fora that, they, that they've established over the many years to engage with. So I'm not really expecting uh, a, a, any sort of surprise downsides at this stage uh, in the bilateral relationship uh, between the two countries. Uh, we hope to move ahead on things like EVs, critical minerals. These are, are things that are important to both countries. So I think we've kind of got vested interests, as, as you could say, uh, in ensuring uh, that goes well because it has big implications for both economies in the region. And one of the fundamental bases of our the trade agreement, the trade investment and people movement agreement, the sort of the comprehensive economic partnership agreement that was signed uh, into force about three four years ago, um, is a view that we should see the commercial relationship not merely a matter of what we can each flog off to each other. Uh, you know, recalling that collectively we're what two percent of the world economy, but actually what we can do together that creates new competitive advantages enabling what we produce collectively to enter the much bigger 25% of the region. And, and so that become, that's become an important informing uh, mindset uh, into both the negotiations and post, post-contractual uh, arrangements. So I think in that regard, it's good. Um, what we, uh, for, I guess, really from an Australian perspective, um, we now run a significant trade surplus, at least on the current account, with Indonesia. Um, we also do with Japan, Korea, China, uh, probably yeah. Tha- Thailand. Uh, and that's because these countries have industrialised and become incredibly prosperous on the basis of having secure access to quality, affordable resources from Australia. And so then they buy this whatever we flog off off the ground in Australia, convert it into manufacturing value added and then go on and take on the world. So they have huge surpluses with the world, just happens to be they have big deficits with us. Whereas on the other hand, we run a huge deficit with the US and with Europe uh, because you're not buying our stuff. Uh, you've probably got better sources closer to where, wherever you're all from. Um, so Indonesia will need to understand that dynamic as well. And if mm-hmm. they if they were to try to pursue some kind of a mercantilist view that, you know, every grain of whatever is sent from one side has to be equated with something, they'll miss the bus again and Vietnam or India will end up being the, the, the next big ship off the, the road around Asia for serious industrialisation benefiting uh, from what Australia is able to provide. So I'm hoping uh, that uh, that kind of understanding uh, will filter through uh, many of the policy people here so that they understand the great value that Australia provides to them and better provision because it's even closer than, than was Japan and China and Korea when they were going through their industrialization program. So they actually have slight better benefits, uh, bigger benefits in some of these issues than the others did. But, uh, so that's, I think, uh, an important part of the policy dialogue uh, that we need to work on uh, between t- the two countries. Yeah. Um, your your uh, 
based in Jakarta. How long have you been in Jakarta now? So about, uh, so, um, so four years in Aceh. Most of the rest of the time in Jakarta. A year in Makassar in South Sulawesi. A little bit of time in Jogja. And a bit of time in Bandung and upriver in the center of Kal- uh, in the center of Kalimantan, but it's mostly been in Jakarta. W- will you be making the move to the new capital along along with the government, <laughs> or uh, or stick- <laughs> sticking where the culture is? Yeah, I also spent a few years living in Canberra. Uh, Canberra was dedicated to be the the capital city around about 1910, I think. The provisional parliament opened in 1927. Uh, when I arrived there in 1988, we had like two television stations. Um, but uh, it it has prospects for being an incredibly attractive city. Um, when, um, uh, as you know, this has been something that's sort of being part of an Indonesian dream for since President Sukarno in the mid 50s, right? The, the mid to late 50s. The idea of the capital being somewhere closer to the centre of the country. So this is not a new thing. And there have been several efforts to try to push this idea forward and they've all fallen on their face. As I said, one thing about this president is when he sets his mind to something, it happens. And and so he's able to push beyond the sort of the bureaucratic or corporate vested interests that will try to scuttle something if they don't win and all of that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. So when I heard that the deputy of the development authority was a property developer who was somewhere in one of the running part of the one of the big conglomerates here, my my initial sort of reaction was, oh, God, what does this mean? But then I visited the city where he had been what you might call the CEO. So uh, on some of the fringe cities around Jakarta, the satellite cities, they're basically private sector, you know, conglomerate development, urban centres where, you you know, hundreds of thousands of people eventually live there. They have to manage the integration of everything, the transport and everything Mm -hmm. like that. And so as I'm heading off the highway, this is like the first time in decades that I've visited that part of the region, I suddenly felt myself breathing easier. As you turned off, it was as if I could see a city built into the forest. Not the usual thing of you knock everything down and start putting up trees. This literally felt like I was moving into, and it was the most wonderful, relaxing feeling. And I thought to myself, if this is Jokowi's vision for what Nusantara should look like, this will be quite a spectacular place. So as they were just soon after they decided to, do, to go there, I visited. And, of course, what I discovered was there are actually no trees there. What there, are there, what, there are no forests there. There are a lot of trees because all the trees were knocked off. The forests were destroyed decades ago uh, and replaced with um, uh, pulp and paper, eucalyptus trees from Australia that are pretty bad for the water tables, frankly. Uh, and so in my view, absolutely no loss to humanity if all of those rotten things are removed. Uh, and if they could actually use that as an opportunity to replant with indigenous species, we could actually see a recovery. And so most of the Nusantara zone is actually not for development. It's actually for uh, for redevelopment, replanting, reforestation and all of that. So it's a little bit like the Australian Capital Territory. Canberra is only one small part of the broader Australian Capital Territory zone. So mm-hmm. in, in my view, it actually offers an opportunity to begin to re- to repair some of the long-term damage that was done through deforestation uh, back in the 80s and 90s, and so I'm you know any of the any of the environmentalists who start snivelling and crying about the poor you know orangutans or whatever there are no orangutans there, and there are no <laughs> and there are no indigenous trees. Uh, there's also undulating kind of uh, territory, so actually even creating sort of waterways, little lakes again, mm-hmm. could, uh, could enhance both the attract- attraction of the region, deal a little bit maybe with the, the heat issues, um, but, uh, uh, but also, you know, help maybe to secure water resources a little bit better than they may be able to secure at the moment. So mixed picture, what I want to, uh, what I want to live there, I'll, I'll take a look when I start to see what's, what's going on, uh, but my suspicion is possibly not at this stage. But uh, if 
very keen to see how it how it develops. Um, I also think that there's no great hurry to shift there tomorrow. So, I mean, the president's been absolutely uh, almost manic about getting it built as quickly as possible, ostensibly to ensure that no subsequent successor can say, well, we're going to stay in Jakarta because mm-hmm. the investment has been simply too significant. Uh, but do they need to finish it tomorrow? No. I mean, there's a marvellous date of 2045 when the country turns 100. So there are plenty of opportunities, I think, to get things prepared. Do it beautifully, you know, not a quick and dirty. Do it beautifully. And you'll you'll really have a capital of which the whole nation should be incredibly proud. Is there a similar level of urgency for helping fix Jakarta and the problems that it has? I, I often think of, you know, I live in New Orleans myself. Like when you look around at the cities that are, that are at the front line of climate change, I mean, Jakarta's it's going to experience a lot of these things that we're worried about from a climate change perspective earlier than everywhere else. Is there some awareness of that? Is it just, it's too far gone? Like how do you live with that on a daily basis? Well, I don't have any problems actually. So where it is, is the Northern end of the city. That's, that's where the problems are. And for some bizarre reason, very, some very, very rich people have all decided they want to move there. And so they build these like reclaimed areas. And so I don't know how long it'll be before they start to face troubles. Um, that's really literally on the northern tips of Jakarta facing into mm-hmm. Jakarta Harbour. Um, I've also travelled up to northern Jakarta on a beautifully sunny day and suddenly come to flooding in the road. So, and I've also, you know, visited this hotel on the, on the, the shoreline that used to have lovely grass uh, at the front. Now it's kind of underwater. So, yeah, you, you absolutely can see uh, the impact of both sea level rising and also groundwater uh, remove, uh, reducing. And so then the salination into the water table, which has advanced many kilometres south. So Jakarta, you need to understand, is a city that's moved over the 350-odd years. Mm. So it moves south pretty much every generation. It's continued moving south. So unlike many other cities where I guess you, uh, you kind of build over an earlier era, this place that kind of has moved further south. So there are kind of of uh, residue, even going back to the the Dutch East Indies Company Day. Forget about the Dutch East Indies colonial administration from the nineteen, you know, beginning of the nineteenth century. Uh, going back to the Dutch East Indies, you know, Veronique East India Company, the VOC, uh, back back before that in the seventeenth, eighteenth century. So you've kind of seen back there an early independence period. Then there was sort of, you know, by the uh, turn of the century, I guess we'd probably move towards what they call a Hotel Indonesia roundabout. And now we're probably closer towards uh, near the Sinaian roundabout. So the, the city actually moves south and the further south you go, obviously you start to rise up. So, I mean, it's not as if there aren't options to dealing with it. But, yeah, at some point you're just going to have to leave some of this land and uh, that's, that's going to have horrendous uh, implications particularly for people who own land there uh, mm-hmm. uh, and, and so forth. Um, you know, so there are, all, there are a lot of Dutch people at one stage looking to sort of, you know, do the Dutch, the Dutch answer with sort of polders and stuff like that to see whether that might work. But there are dozens of rivers that flow through Jakarta to the sea or tributaries. And so that's, uh, that's an additional uh, challenge as to how you deal with that. Uh, if, even if you're trying to build polders and dams and walls. Yeah. But I would have um, thought there are ways to do, you actually start to refill in aquifers under the ground and uh, and work a lot harder on building proper, you know, town water delivery systems so people don't have to be drilling wells and sucking up the water table. Uh, so the damage being done by salination and, and also drying out. You know, I think part of that is to ensure that there are, technologies that allow you to send rainwater back into towards the aquifers and there is technology to allow that that would be a very useful thing to do uh to stop the pace of lamb subsidence at least yeah absolutely um before i let you go um let's do i mean this really has nothing to do with geopolitics but in some way it has everything to do with geopolitics i'm curious what your favorite thing to eat is in in jakarta what what about indonesian cuisine has captured your uh, imagination or has it is it everything else about indonesia and the food's not good i i don't know much about indonesian food well i spent a year in makassar so i absolutely have to say choto makassar which is a kind of a a, a a a meaty brothy kind of dish uh which i really enjoy 
Um, and obviously the satays are, are always excellent. There's a very nice one from Central Java called Sate Buntal, which most people don't know about. But, uh, you know, chicken satay, um, goat, goat satay. We don't have many sheep here, but goats. Um, I would also say uh, rendang, obviously. You can't go beyond rendang. Uh, anything with durian in is always a great, is always a great mm. thing. I know that uh, that's always controversial. You know, durian's always a controversial fruit. You either love well, or it, hate it. it. There's it, no it middle ground sense. on that one. Well, it makes sense that an Australian who probably likes, you know, Marmite and Vegemite would then go and, and, and be okay with. <laughs> yeah, that is true. So, <laughs> so they actually have their own version. I say they have their own version of Marmite, the Malaysians and Indonesians. Um, Indonesians call it prasi. Malaysians call it blachan. And it's actually made from fermented fish head, uh, from, uh, fermented prawn heads. And it's often oh. used as a kind of a flavoring in, in various kind of savory dishes. Um, and it has a very pungent smell. So I say that that's their version of Vegemite. <laughs> yeah, well, good. You're, you're right at home. Um, Kevin, thanks so much for taking the time. This was a pleasure for me. I hope you enjoyed yourself, and I hope you'll agree to this come back on. This has been absolutely awesome. And, uh, and I hope your viewers get some fun out of it as well. Uh, I'm sure they will. And I mean, Indonesia, I mean, it may be invisible, but it's not going anywhere. I think it's going to be increasingly more important. So I, I hope Spot you'll on. continue to come on and, and tell Spot us. Spot on. So. Look forward to again. Take care to everybody. Thank you so much for listening to the Cognitive Dissidents podcast brought to you by Cognitive Investments. If you are interested in learning more about cognitive investments, you can check us out online at cognitive.investments. That's cognitive.investments. Uh, you can also write to me directly if you want at jacob at cognitive.investments. Cheers, and we'll see you out there. The views expressed in this commentary are subject to change based on market and other conditions. This podcast may contain certain statements that may be deemed forward-looking statements. Please note that any such statements are not guarantees of any future performance, and actual results or developments may differ materially from those projected. Any projections, market outlooks, or estimates are based upon certain assumptions and should not be construed as indicative of actual events that will occur. Cognitive Investments LLC is a registered investment advisor. Advisory services are only offered to clients or prospective clients where Cognitive and its representatives are properly licensed or exempt from licensure. For additional information, please visit our website at www.cognitive.investments. The information provided is for educational and informational purposes only and does not constitute investment advice and it should not be relied on as such. It should not be considered a solicitation to buy or an offer to sell a security. It does not take into account any investor's particular investment objectives, strategies, tax status, or investment horizon. You should consult your attorney or tax advisor.